so chill. Kevin Coast for coming. Um, such an exciting day. Who's ready to see Kevin and Jay get down in the wet cement? <laughs> and then be immortalized forever. What a special place to do it too. Um, so I'm so proud and happy to uh, to be here today. It's such a warm family event. So we passed around a book to describe Kevin Smith in one word. Um, his daughter Harley says authentic. Jay says smart. Uh, let's see, we have magnificent, cool, spelt, one of a kind, cute Kevin, and then Ben Affleck says genius. So it's my honor to introduce to you Ben Affleck. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you. All right. Uh, uh, it's the bomb and phantoms. This is the last day I'm going to put up with that bomb and phantom show. Uh, I'm very excited. I'm very honored to be here. I know it's supposed to be about like uh, Kevin and Jay, but keeping with Hollywood uh, tradition, I'd like to make it about me. Uh, appropriate. Uh, you know, when I, I, I came out to L.A. in the early 90s, I was a struggling actor, and I, uh, I couldn't even, like, you know... Oh, uh, there we go. Move back. So I came out to L.A., I was a struggling actor, and uh, I, I, I was sort of awkward, big, and goofy looking, and I guess I must have been kind of off-putting, because I couldn't even get an audition for like the leading roles of anything. But every time some project showed up, the casting director would be like, they're not interested in you for any of the main parts. But there is a kind of a douchey, unpleasant villain that we think you would be right for. And so uh, I played that part in School Ties. I was the douchey anti-Semite. Uh, Days to Get Views, I was the annoying villain who chased people around with a paddle. <clears throat> and then one director had the singular vision to cast me as the annoying, douchey guy with a suit. And mall rats, which I will for, be forever grateful. Uh, one of them was the director of the movie. He was a guy who could not stop talking about himself. The other one was the director's friend, uh, who uh, had only ever acted one time before in a black and white movie called Clerks. And the two of them had a kind of a special relationship that I couldn't quite figure out. They were either brothers or, or best friends or a surrogate father and a wayward son or possibly husband and wife. You know, um, they were sweet, but they, they, they cursed like sailors, to be honest. In fact, this is a true story. I subsequently did a USO tour and was taken on an aircraft carrier, and the XO said, you know, some of these guys curse like Jay and Silent Bob. So, uh, the off-screen dynamic they had was really kind of adorable because, you know, in the, in the movies, the big one followed the little one around, but in real life, the little one followed the bigger one around all the time. So whether they were working or not, they were kind of always together, like um, Snoopy and Woodstock by way of Bill and Ted, sort of, or Bert and Ernie by way of Cheech and Chong. They were, they were loyal to each other for whatever reason, and suddenly they were loyal to this guy from Boston who they barely knew, and they became part of their view askew family. And the little one would say kind of nonsensical things like snoogans and snoochie-boochies and call people used guys, and uh, the bigger one would say nonsensical things like, Paul Rats can make a hundred million dollars. <laughs> It's only off by 98 million. <laughs> Even more nonsensical, he said, I'm going to make you the lead of, of my next movie. And um, they may say a lot of nonsensical things, but they don't bullshit. And I did get a big role in the director's next movie, and the next one, and the next one, and the next one. And for a while, I, I really feel like we were like Scorsese and De Niro. You know, if none of Scorsese and De Niro's movies got critical acclaim, or made any money, or got any awards, and we're all set in New Jersey. <clears throat> uh, so his, his little friend was kind of our Joe, Joe Pesci character, the, the motor mouth clown who amused everybody, but who you kind of knew was uh, somehow secretly sort of a genius. And uh, we built our careers together while laughing and learning about the movie business. We dreamed our dreams together until a lot of them came true. And it was, kind of, it was really the most fun I ever had uh, making movies absolutely the least profitable, but um, the most fun, for sure. In fact, 
you know, I really owe Kevin <clears throat> for starting my own career off as a filmmaker. When I was doing Mall Rats, I kept telling him how I was, you know, with me and my friend, we wanted to write the script, and you know, I finally got the courage up and asked him to read it. And uh, I flew out of town, I came back, and he pulled me aside and said, I want you to know, start reading your script on the toilet. I said, thank you. He goes, I didn't get off until I finished it. Which turns out that's Kevin's highest form of praise. But he was very encouraging. The idea that like some guy with no connections and no money, and no, in my case, education to speak of, could actually like get a movie made and, and have something to say and, and make a contribution. And he's an executive producer on that movie. And um, my, my really principal main regret about the Oscars and that whole movie is that on Oscar night, I, I neglected to thank Kevin because I was kind of overwhelmed. And there really would be no Good Will Hunting script, certainly wouldn't have gotten made without him. So um, I want to take this opportunity to remedy that. Pretend that I'm on the stage, the Oscars are saying, thank you, Kevin Smith, very, very much. <laughs> um, you know, because these guys are sort of like the American dream come true. If the American dream was to talk about comic books and dissect love and analyze Star Wars using every curse word on the planet. When I told people I was going to speak for them today, <clears throat> as they got their handprints in cement at the Chinese theater, the average response was two things. First, was really? And the second one was, good for these guys. And the first response, really, I think, is, is because when we think of the Chinese theater footprints, we think of larger than life Hollywood legends, you know, people like Jack Nicholson or, you know, R2-D2. And the guys from All Rats, I feel like, are sort of joining that second group. You know what I mean? And good for those guys comes after the, you know, you do the math and you realize that, um, these guys are Hollywood legends now. We don't think of them as such because we've seen them hanging around the same convenience store. You don't think of legends as the guys who sell you weed outside 7-Eleven. And yet, uh, that's, that's who they are. You know, the legends aren't people you actually know. They're, they're legends, and legends break the mold, and that's what these two have been doing for a quarter of a century, breaking the mold for over and over. So it would stand the reason they broke the legend mold, too. They couldn't even do that the right way because, you know, they're from New Jersey. Um, <laughs> Keep the car running. <laughs> uh, they've been hanging around the quick stop for 25 years, but today Jay and Simon Bob start hanging around the TL TCL Chinese Theater Courtyard forever, ensconced in cement with all the other Hollywood legends, right where they belong. Uh, I, I'm really, really grateful to these two guys, and I have to say, I just love them so much. Thank you, and uh, thank you, thank you very much. attack I slept at the hospital on your couch I was scared shitless waking up every hour or so to check on you that was the scariest day of my entire life and as much as I'd like to forget about it I do think it's important to remember so that we can compare to where you're at today you have proven to everyone really just how impressive of a human you are you came back from your heart attack and completely changed your life you went vegan, which was not really a choice as much as it was forced upon you by me, but still you completely changed your life and you are the healthiest you've ever been. Not only did you change your personal life, but you came back and made a movie, which is really the end game of your films. You somehow managed to gather everyone from your past to make a movie you've been on a quest to make for years. You always joke and say that it's your heart attack that made the movie possible because everyone felt guilty enough to come be a part of it, but I don't agree with that. I think it's your strength, tenacity, and perseverance that made this possible. My whole life, you've made a living by essentially making fun of yourself, but you are truly a magical human being, and I hope you know that. You have proven that you can literally do anything that you set your mind to, and you inspire me endlessly. You are my dad, my director, but mostly my best friend. I'm so insanely proud of both of you and beyond thrilled that you are receiving this honor today. Dad, Jay, I love you more than I can possibly say. Thank you for being the best dads I could ever wish for.
Oh my gosh, sorry. I'm like throwing it back back there. I can hear um Well, sorry, me and Kevin are both back there crying. <laughs> sorry, the sweet things Ben and uh Harley both said is is really amazing. Uh being here is super surreal for me because um I mean who would have like I would never thought that I'd be able to put my handprints in here like uh, ben said earlier like I walk by and you see big huge names here and so for me to find out uh, When they told me that I was getting my handprints in the cement out here was I don't know It's still like a uh, Floating over but I don't know. I'm not the wordsmith here Kevin is but I do want to say man uh, <laughs> You'll see it's funny because he talks more than me in real life and in the movies, you know I talk but I, I do want to say thank you to Ben and Harley Hardly had me crying back there, which wasn't a good start. So I'm like, how am I going to get up there and say anything sweet? But I do want to thank, uh, you know, I owe this all to Kevin. It's like Kevin saw me, 13-year-old kid, um, hanging around the community center and said, wow, this kid has a weird sense of humor and says funny things. And when he wrote his script, Clerks, he, he thought to write me in there. Um, and then he wrote me in the next movie, even though the studio fought him on it and made me audition, he still fought for me. Um, and then put me in the next movie, the next movie. Um, it wasn't something I planned on doing was movies because I, I just thought like, oh, one day I'm gonna own my own roofing business and I'm gonna be somebody. Um, and I don't have like my family history. I, I've talked about a lot on my podcasts and stuff. Um, and I mentioned that because like my mom was in and out of jail and I live with my grandma, my aunt and all this. But the reason I mentioned that is because Kevin not only like put me in a movie um, and became someone I looked up to, um, became my friend, but then he let me into his family, which, you know, I got to see Harley uh, be born um, and his wife Jen, they took me in, and then I got to meet Gail and Byron, who were another extension of my family, um, and it really helped me uh, stay on course, even when I had some troubles um, with the drugs and stuff, like, he, he was always there for me, and I really owe everything to Kevin, uh, you know, the movies, and just uh, being around, because I, I always... He was always there to help me out and support me. And then my wife, I met my wife, Jordan Monsanto, um, and she's been a big, strong uh, part of me uh, trying to uh, you know, stay on the straight and narrow, because then we had a kid, she's, her name's Logan. I wanted to bring her today, but my wife wouldn't let me. I wanted to sneak her handprint in the, in the handprint thing, but anyway, um, I appreciate everyone for being here, man. This is such a big deal. It's so surreal to me. Uh, if you told me I'd ever get this, I would tell you you were a liar. Um, and it's amazing. And thank you, Kevin, uh, Harley, Ben, Jen, and Gail and Byron, and Jordan, and everyone else. Uh, this is awesome. Now I'm going to let this guy talk. Get comfy, motherfuckers. Um, um, first off, uh, I want to thank uh, everybody for showing up today. I really want to thank uh, Ben and Harley for the amazingly kind words. Uh, did anybody else notice that we were lucky enough to get both the Batman and Harley Quinn to intro us? Uh, makes a lot of sense in my world. Ladies and gentlemen, to understand what this moment means to me and my family, i got to take you back. Uh, to the 70s. Uh, my father, Don Smith, uh, was a postal employee and he married uh, this woman, uh, a Jersey girl named Grace, who's here somewhere. There's my mom. My mom's here today. Um, they had three kids, Virginia, Donald, and Kevin. I was the last kid. Uh, I was born on my brother's birthday, uh, August 2nd. He was born 66. Not August 2nd, I was born August 2nd, 1970. Interestingly enough, my sister was born on August 10th, like a year before my brother. So we were all born in August, which means my parents really liked to fuck in November. Um, election fuckers. So... So, Don Smith, like, didn't really uh, want for much. I asked him once when I was a kid, uh, like, hey, what were your dreams when you were young, Dad? Like, what did you want to do? And he was like, I wanted to get married and have kids. And so his dreams happened early on. His career wasn't about what made him feel good in life or fulfilled. He just had to get a job to pay for what made him feel good in life, what made him feel fulfilled, uh, his wife and his kids. And we were, I'd like to say, lower, 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 lower middle 
class and stuff. Uh, but my mom was a financial whiz who could make a buck stretch. And because of that, even though we were poor, we would go on vacations. Um, that was important to my dad because he worked at the post office. And if he didn't go on vacations, he might have went postal and shit. Uh, so he never did. We were very proud of him for that. He would go on these vacations and he would take his places. Um, that meant something to him. And he took us here in 1979. My family got on a train from New Jersey. Uh, me, my mom, my dad, my brother and sister and came to Hollywood because I love the movies. I love TV, I love the movies, I loved Hollywood when I was growing up. And that was what we shared, me and my father. You know, it was like he told my mom, the fat one likes movies, I'm gonna do movies with him and stuff. So he would take me to the movies all the time and lean into my fascination with the movie business, even though we were the furthest thing in the world from it in New Jersey. So we came here to the courtyard in 1979 and walked around for an hour looking at all the footprints and the handprints and naturally there were some that were older than I would remember and my father would explain who they were, you know. My brother and I knelt in front of R2-D2, C-3PO and Darth Vader's footprints and uh, my dad took a picture of us, although my sister says she took the picture. So I don't know if memory's foggy, but I do remember this. My old man, he was not like the chattiest guy in the world and stuff. Um, but every once in a while he would say something that like deeply impacted. And since he was my dad, and since all parents are God to a child, everything he said at that age impacted, particularly when we were here in Hollywood. He'd taken us to Hollywood. And here we were standing amongst all the stars and the legends. We took the picture, my old man, as we're going through all the footprints and shit, my old man says six stupid fucking words. Six stupid things that you say to a fucking kid when you're at a baseball field if they're into baseball or any sports or or if there's some place where they have a vague interest in it and stuff uh my old man was looking at the footprints and he saw me look at the footprints put my hands in the handprints and stuff and he said this stupid shit that you just say to a kid pass the time nice thing to say he goes maybe you'll be here one day he didn't mean it, he wasn't planting it, he wasn't planting a seed. We had no path to this world whatsoever. It's just some stupid shit that you say to your kid to pass the time. But ladies and gentlemen, you have to be careful of the stupid shit you say to your kids. Sometimes it takes deep root. Because of that, I've been telling my kids since she was a child, uh, you know, one day you'll be a billionaire who'll fire, finance all my movies and shit. Just, just in case it fucking worked like it did on me. Um, the last time uh, me and my mom and my brother and my sister were in this courtyard was with my dad in 1979. It's 40 years from that moment when my father said it. This was left of my father, uh, ladies and gentlemen. This is uh, some of his ashes. Um, this is the first time in 40 years my whole family is back together again in this courtyard, and I couldn't imagine a better fucking reason for it. Thank you, Dad. Um, Uh, in the way of thanks, let me just keep going. So many people, of course, I thank my dad, I thank my mom, who was always incredibly supportive and, and the second biggest Kevin Smith fan on the planet, me being the first. Um, I thank my sister, who taught me what writing was. You know, at an early age, I found a composition notebook that she had under her bed, and inside there was a drawing of her and her friends around a door. And the cover page was what the secret of the cell what was it? Was the secret. Secrets beyond the trap door. And I said, What is this? And she said, I'm writing a book. And I was like, You can't just write a book. You have to ask the government and stuff. And she's like, Why do you say that? I was like, Because we had to get like a library card to take books out of the library. I was very young. And so uh, she said, You don't need permission from the government to write. Anybody can write anything. You can write anything anytime you want. Anyway, it's free to write. I spent my life uh, writing. My brother is, was my absolute first audience. Um, you don't know if you could do something unless you try it, and then somebody says, good job. I, I wrote a story about going to visit our relatives, remember? And like, I, 
scariest thing in the world is like taking a piece of yourself, putting it down, handing it to somebody else and saying, what do you think? And I was a kid, so I needed approval. And I handed it to him because my brother's the best laugher in the world, man. When he laughs at shit, you really feel like you're funny. And he laughed at it, and not at it, but with it. And he said it was good. And I watched him read the words, and like his emotions changed. And I felt like a wizard, a magician. Magic words changed the emotions in the man's body and stuff like that. That impacted me in a big, bad way. Gave me something to chase like a dragon for my whole life. Um, I want to thank everyone I ever worked with, like Ben and Harley, of course, recently, all the actors I've ever worked with, Brian O'Hara is here, Marilyn is here, the people that absolutely dreamed with me and made it all possible, brought words to life and whatnot. Um, I thank uh, Byron and Gail, Jen's parents, who have always been there for me. Of course, I thank my wife who brought me out here. I didn't want to leave New Jersey. And she said, there's a better way to live. And, and we came out here, we've been out here for almost 20 years, and that means everything, because this is the only other place in New Jersey that I ever wanted to be, that I ever wanted to live, was in Hollywood. She gave me a beautiful daughter who I now make movies with. Um, Harley makes the job fun again. I was never losing interest, but suddenly my kid was interested in movies. I'm like, I know a thing or two about movies. Like, don't listen to the critics. I do. And suddenly I was able to start working with her as a professional. Um, so I thank her uh, for giving me like a second chance, not just by making me vegan and whatnot. Used to be happy, now I'm fucking vegan. Um, but she saved my life, you know, in doing so. Um, I want to thank Ely and Lisa for letting us do this. Wonderful people who we met in San Diego when we put our hands in the cement. And I told him what it meant to me, and he was like, we could do that here. And I was like, what? Like, suddenly, I was going to be amongst people I've looked up to my whole life, other Hollywood legends. Thank you so much for that. Um, thank you to all the people who are working on James Silent Bob Reboot right now, Saban Films, Universal. Uh, Rob, my publicist, Rogers and Carolyn, everybody who's trying to help out right now. Uh, movie comes out this week, we're very excited. Uh, big thanks go out to Jordan Monsanto, uh, Jason's uh, good lady wife. Uh, for the last 10 years, Jason and I have been saying things to Jordan like, we want to do this, we want to do that, we would like to do this, and Jordan always finds a way to facilitate it, man. We're all just out. Come join us. Hollywood is a magical place. It sounds ridiculous to say, but it really is in many ways a great equalizer, bringing all sorts of diversity together in the pursuit of, of the dream, of telling the story, of capturing an imagination, of making people forget for one day, for one moment, like their troubles, or that, you know, one day they're gonna die and stuff. It's, it's a great, business and Hollywood is a great town, a magical town. And when I was a kid, I believed that. And I've lived here for almost 20 years and I still absolutely believe that. I believe in Hollywood as the land of hope and dreams, man. And I, I can't get out of here without quoting a poet <clears throat> who means the world to me. He's also from New Jersey. Uh, his name is Bruce Springsteen. And he wrote a song called Land of Hope and Dreams, man. This, I think it really applies to our town and our business. The refrain chorus goes, this train, which refers to this town, this train carries saints and sinners, this train carries losers and winners, this train carries whores and gamblers, this train carries lost souls, this train carries broken hearted thieves and sweet souls departed, this train carries fools and carries kings, this train all aboard, this train dreams will not be thwarted, this train of faith will be rewarded. Meet me in a land of hope and dreams. Ladies and gentlemen, we're in the land of hope and dreams. And thank you for letting me hang out with you this long. I love you all.
If you guys enjoyed that video, please smash that like button and also hit that notification bell next to the subscribe button so you guys can be up to date with all our videos. So once again, smash that like button and hit that notification bell next to the subscribe button and check you guys out later and keep on shocking them, bros.